Good afternoon. Today is August 4th, 2016. My name is Lauren Miller and I'm here at the Noon Free Library with Thomas O'Connor. Today, we, together we are participating in the Newton Talks Oral History Project that is being conducted with the Newton Free Library, Historic Newton, and the Newton Senior Center. So what is your connection to Newton? Um, I used to be a custodian. I started in uh, 1984, August of 1984, and I worked up till, I believe, January of 2011. But in that time, I moved from Brookline to Newtonville, which was great because if my car ever broke down, I could walk 10 minutes to Newton North High School. And that's my connection. I've been living in Newton, Newtonville for 13 years now, since uh, 2003. If you lived in Newton before and after your service, what did you miss most about home aside from family and friends? Well, I, I used to think that, um, you know, you just miss all the activity. Not so much, well, of course you miss your family and friends, but you know, what's going on, who's mm -hmm. doing what, who, you know, a few people have passed away, young people, so. What yes. were you doing before you entered the service? I was a high school student at Brookline, uh, Brookline High. What was your life like before you entered the service? I was just a typical teenager. It was the uh, early 70s and all the things that went with that at the time. It was a pretty, pretty wild time, good time. How did you join the drip and why did you choose that specific branch? I, um, well, I enlisted, I went down, me and a few friends, there was three other friends, we went down. At the time, the enlistment office was on Tremont Street, right across from, I believe, Park Street Station then. So we went down, and we all enlisted. I didn't have any plans after high school, so I, you know, I saw this as an opportunity maybe to go to Germany or something, or overseas. And um, so the four of us went in and enlisted and then we all went in together in June 23rd and um, wanted to get out in basic training. And three of us went through basic training and school together. And two of my friends went to Germany and I got to stay right in Oklahoma, which I don't regret. I met a lot of nice people. And it was only for two years too, so I didn't think two years was not such a bad deal. How did you adapt to military life, including including the physical regime, barracks, food, and social life? Well, I'll put it this way: I was in no shape. That was, you know, I did try to jog a little bit, maybe a mile around the book, old book. Well, it's still there, the Brookline Reservoir, and so I do it a couple of times. Think, yeah, I'm ready to go, but I wasn't, and so uh, yeah, they, you know, they, they keep you going with the physical training. The, you know, the food was good, I thought. And they they would, you know, you always go, go, go. And so when it was time to go to sleep, you were ready. You would, because you had to get up at, I think, 4.30, 5 o'clock. And, so, and then, you know, I wasn't used to folding clothes and, and, all, and being organized. And they make you organized. You know, your socks have to be rolled up and underwear and this and that. And, Uniforms, you can't be missing buttons or any holes or anything. And you had to look good all the time. And so it was, it was an experience. And did you like the structure there? I, yeah, I've been told I, I do good in a structured environment. So, <laughs> How did you stay in touch with family and friends back home? Uh, back then, it would be writing or the old telephone. Yeah, will you accept a quick call from the Thomas O'Connor? Yeah, we'll accept it. And then... After calling one too many times, they'd say, you know, you can't be calling all, you know, it's long distance. i say, okay, I get that. It's, I was just so excited, you know, that's all. Try to get the latest gossip, anything <laughs> if I could catch up on. Do you remember arriving where you served, and what was it like? I remember um, we all used to meet, well, the day we left. I think we took our oath, and then we went to Logan Airport, then flew to Louisville, and then they had like two buses. And I ended up, they had so many people that I ended up standing 
a bunch of us had to stand because there's no more room in the seats. Got to um, Fort Knox, Kentucky, maybe an hour and a half. And then they, um, they gave us, well, you know, they fed us, but they gave us a little lecture and they, they fed us that night and they didn't wake us up like they normally would so early because they knew we just came in late at night. And so I just remember like the next morning hearing people running, uh-oh, I think, <clears throat> I think a lot of people thought, oh my God, what did I get into? Tell me about a few of your most memorable experiences. Well, uh, I can't remember them all, but I, I remember one time when we were shooting at Fort Sill, I was on the phone and they'll say like fire mission. And um, they would say like uh, four rounds. They would tell you how much powder you needed. And then they would say um, deflection, which is this way and then quadrant that way. And then I would yell it out and give it to the, the section chief who was a sergeant and the gunner. And so we shot, and then one day they said, okay, stop. Everybody get to the back of the gun. So I said, oh, geez, I don't know. This ain't good. And what happened was we, I don't even know if I should say this, but it was so long ago. They have a forward observer, which is an officer, and he gives you, he gives the uh, quadrants and deflections and everything. And I don't think he had done that yet, but we still had the fire mission, and we actually shot off of Fort Sill. And we were told that there was a, guy out there with a tractor or something he heard and luckily he didn't get hurt or something but they had civilians and all these top officers and I thought oh I'm going to Leavenworth I just got in for goodness sakes but they found out it was the forward observer or something it was messed up so <laughs> any other experiences yeah I, I never knew how to drive a standard so they were asking for drivers. So I said, here's my big opportunity to learn how to drive a standard. So we went to like a driving school. Back then they had the Jeeps. They still had the deuce and a half trucks, the five tons, the Jeeps. And uh, so I would learn, you know, and uh, I don't know how I got my license, but they gave it to me. And so whenever we were going to different places, they'd have a convoy, maybe 10 trucks, and they'd load up the trucks. And I was always trying to be at the last, the end, because I was not used to this, you know, taking the foot off the clutch. And so I, I really dreaded hills, because when you're on a hill, you got to let out the clutch, clutch and step on the gas, and you don't want to stall out, but you don't want to roll back too far, because there's another <coughs> truck. And I can remember guys were screaming in the back of the truck for a new driver and everything, and this guy's gonna kill us, and, but I stuck it out. And, so I got to learn how to drive a standard, which was a nice thing I thought at the time. Are there any particularly humorous or exciting memories from when you were on leave? No, I think I took my first leave Christmas of 76. I came home and, uh, you know, saw a lot of friends and everything, and got to do a few things. And I um, I think my parents were a little disappointed because I came home and they were there. It was my mother, father, a couple of my aunts, and they thought I might be in uniform in my dress greens. But it was still right after the Vietnam War, so it was still like a, so I said, man, I'm putting on my ripped jeans and my shirt, and I just remember the disappointment when I came in, you know, you get off the airplane and you walk through the looks on their faces when they look like Joe Schmo or Ragmuffin or something. They were so disappointed. And, but I, I, you know, that's fate. I was, I wear enough of the uniform at, at, you know, at work. So I just wanted to, except for the short hair, I just wanted to fit in with civilian clothes. Do you recall the day your service ended? Yes, I do. It was... I think I get out a little early because I had a month's vacation that I didn't take. So I get out, instead of June, I get out in May. And I brought one of my roommates back with me. He never been, he was from Texas and he never been to Boston. So I brought him up. He had a pretty good time. And I remember bringing him on the green line. It was the old trolleys then. And uh, they had the screeching and squealing. 
And I remember getting to Boylston Street, and it takes that turn, and he was holding his ears. He couldn't believe how loud it was. I felt sorry for him, but even today, I'm not used to it. I was on, I was on the trolley today, and it's the same thing even with the new trolleys. They still, that, that screeching sound. You think I just it was my first time ever being in the subway? I could never get used to that sound. What was it like to return to civilian life? It was really strange because uh, even though I did come home once in '76 for Christmas, it, just even two years of not being home, I, I lost like I felt like I lost touch with everything. You know, I missed a lot, and you're trying to get comfortable with friends. I had, I mean, I close group of friends, but other people that you knew to say hello and everything. Some people probably didn't even know I was away, and some people, it was just to get back in touch with everything. And then plus when we, when I got back, I think we lived for maybe about another month or two before we moved, but we still stayed in Brookline. And I brought my, um, when I, I drove home from Oklahoma, Fort Sill, I brought my roommate, in my 67 Chevy Impala. And we drove all the way. I think I drove all the way. I don't even think we drove at all. And I remember driving through New York City, it was like rush hour. And people were beeping at me. And I thought, oh, that's just New York traffic. People were giving me the bird and finger and everything. I said, Jesus, I don't know what the, was it my Oklahoma license plates? So I got to eventually pull over and I had no brake lights. So every time I hit the brake, you know, that's the first thing people who are right behind you, they see those lights come on, they know to stop. And when they don't see those lights and you stop, if they're not paying attention, they'd crash right into you. But I didn't, no problem there. And then I had that car for maybe another few months before it got smashed up. Because of the brake lights? No, unfortunately, that wasn't the reason, but uh, yeah. But when I think about it, 67 Chevy Impala, well, I got up in 77, so it was only 10 years old. But when you tell somebody, 67 Chevy, because I was 10 years old in 67. I remember that was the year the Red Sox, the impossible dream. So uh, yeah, it was, it was nice. How did your service and experiences affect your life and your outlook on war and the military in general? Well, uh, I know, like they said, you weren't drafted, you were in the new volunteer army, but there were a lot of uh, leftover, like, sergeants, or maybe they, were, they weren't they were sergeants at the time, but they became sergeants who were, who did see service. I think I had a drill sergeant, and he was always acting a little strange, and then finally someone asked the, the other drill sergeant, why is he, like, off the wall or something, something, something's not right, and then they told us that he was a prisoner of war for a little while, but he decided to stay in and became a drill sergeant. So now everybody kind of knew why he was off the wall a little bit. He was a good drill sergeant, but just, he just wasn't all there. And then, uh, you know, getting back in shape and wanting to quit all the time and I'm never, not gonna make it. But I would look at other people and say, if these this guy or these guys can do it, I can stick it out. And you're just looking forward to graduation. And I remember the, the first few weeks you didn't do it really, it was all training. I don't even, I, I don't think the first few weeks you could even write home, I can't remember. And then they finally, like in basic training, they finally let you go and you could have a few beers and all that stuff. And so that was nice. You'd go to the E, they call it the E123 club, which is uh, privates. The NCO, NCO club would be for corporals and specialists or somebody like E4 and above. And you'd see all the people and everybody couldn't wait to, have the beers, and I qu I'd quit smoking before I went in. But one of the things is you have to pick up cigarette butts, they called it police detail. So after picking up hundreds of butts, I said, the hell with this, I'm gonna smoke if I have to pick them up. So I started smoking again. But I was so glad when I graduated, boy, I'll tell you. It, would have, it was a great feeling. What would you like people to know 100 years from now? Well, I hope the United States is still around. You know, I hope there's no more wars, but this this uh, Middle East war has been going on for like 14 years now. And it was, I mean, uh, it's, it's, who knows when it's gonna end. 
So I, I, I mean, I don't like war, but I, I have like a history of relatives, uncles and stuff that were in the military. So not ha not going to college and not having a job lined up and not really having any plans. It was kind of like, I'll take the easy route and go in the military for a couple of years and then I'll, I'll have all the things. Everything will be all planned out. I'll be all set and I'll know what I want to do by then. But when I get out, it was the same thing. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add? No, I, I probably when I start walking home, I'll think like a hundred things, but right now, I, I wouldn't be able to, not right now. It was, a, it was a great experience. I don't regret it for one, one second. And like I say, I was in a peacetime from, I went in June of 75 to June, well, I get out early, but June of 77, honorably discharged. And um, it was like my college experience because uh, when I, well, basic training, you were in these big rooms with all these other soldiers. And then school, when I left Fort Knox, Kentucky, went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, it was the old World War II barracks. They still had those around. So you had an upstairs, downstairs, and then you had the latrine. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. I should have shut it off, but I didn't, nobody calls me. But now I'm being interviewed. And I told it to. Right in, hanging up. I, sorry. Um, now I lost my train of thought. Where was it? Oh, the latrine. Mm. So it was a latrine, and you had the showers in there, but it was like 20 toilets. No stalls. It was like just 20 toilets, like this. So that was an experience because, you know, you like privacy. And so when you. You, you know, you have to go to the bathroom, and, and the, especially in the morning, you sit with 20 other guys and everybody's doing the same thing, and you, there's no privacy until you, you got into another building or something. So that was a new experience. I never done that before. And then you had like, uh, each group would have like, someone might have a latrine duty for, oh, come on. I hung up and I thought they would get it. I'm gonna shut it off now. I told her I was going for an interview at 2.30, up here, and so she calls me anyway. Sorry mm. about that. Do you still keep in touch with any of your fellow veterans? No, I just, when I brought the um, one of my roommates up, I, um, oh yeah, we'll stay in touch and everything. I think he wrote me one letter of the friends we used to hang out with. It's just like high school, you have different cliques, and it's the same way in the Army. So he gave me some news and, geez, I'd like to think I wrote him back one letter, but I don't think I did. I was like, you know, I'm back in Brookline. The Army's over with. I don't want nothing to do with it. It's time to move on. But I probably should have wrote him back a letter. So I regret that if I have anything, never writing him back and staying in touch. The only thing I have is photographs of the people I used to hang out with. So I'm glad I got those anyway, memories up here and, and photograph. Anything else you can think of to add? Uh, no, not right off hand. I'm sorry. I, I wish I could. <laughs> it kind of, you know, at the time when I went in, it seemed like it was never going to get over, but the two years went by pretty fast. And then I, there was one unit that I was in. They were going to Germany, but I had less than a year in. So they didn't want to send me over there. You have to have at least 12 or 13 months in to go over the seas. So I tried to enlist for, you know, for a few months, but they wouldn't do it. So I stayed in Oklahoma. But I, I, had, a, I had a great time. You know, you met, met a lot of interested people and stuff like that. So yeah, it was a good, great experience for two years. So I have no regrets. And I'm glad it wasn't wartime either because uh, being in a combat arm thing, artillery, you kind of train for that. And I, there's like a little guilt that I, I wasn't having a real battle, but then you see wounded people coming back with missing arms or limbs or stuff like that, and you, or, you know, just messed up, and you say, you know what, I shouldn't complain, because uh, well, World War II, then it was Korea, then there was a lull period until the early 60s when they started 
So when I was in high school in 71, it was still going on, but I think they were just in the process of starting to withdraw our troops then. So they really weren't sending anybody over there. They were just pulling people out. So yeah, so I, I should be, I'm very grateful that I, I guess I did miss it. Well, it looks like our time is just about up. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this with us. We are really happy to be able to include you in the Newton Talks Oral History Project. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I can't wait to see when everything's finished and you have talked to other veterans and stuff just to see, you know, the final results. Yeah. So thank you.